pianists and teachers. Today we're talking about how to teach the sonata in F major. This is sonata number 38, but it's the Hoboken number 23 by Franz Joseph Haydn, and I'm looking at the first movement. It sounds like this. one of my favorite early advanced sonatas to teach. I know I'm putting this in my intermediate playlist, but I think you could stretch this to be very upper intermediate or consider it early advanced. And it's such a great example of a sonata movement that is so expertly crafted by the composer and is also a motivating and just great piece for early advanced students to play. Today, we're gonna to talk all about scales and chords, articulation, ornamentation, and general character expressive choices for teaching your student this piece. First, if we haven't met before, my name is Jana Williamson and welcome to my home piano studio in Chicago. I realize it's hard to get all the things in that I wanna talk about with a more advanced piece in particular. And so of course, I'm only gonna to touch on some basics here, as well as give you some very specific ideas for teaching. If you're interested in more about this piece, particularly around the area of getting your student ready to perform this from memory, please check out my Patreon page. I'm going to put a little bonus video on that page for my Patreon partners, and I'd love for you to check that out just by clicking the link in the description of this video. So like I said, this is a great example of a mature, very fun, and sparkly sonata for our early advanced students to play. I'm looking at this in my Henley Urtext edition, which I will link also in the description of this video. I also frequently have my students work out of the Alfred Masterworks editions done by Maurice Hinson, and he has so much wonderful introductory material in the opening pages of this book. I wanted to read you one little quote that he has in his general introduction about the piano sonatas. The romantic effusiveness of the sonatas of this period shows the influence of C.P.E. Bach, but the agitated tone and the dark hues of the music are nevertheless disciplined by a compelling logic of thematic development and Beethoven learned much from these works. So just to say again, this is masterfully crafted and there's so many great examples in this piece of wonderfully written sonata, allegro form, as well as Haydn's mature style. So what do our students need to know? We're in F major, so students just need to be very comfortable with F major scales and chord patterns. They also need to understand C major scale and chord patterns, of course, because that's the dominant, as well as D minor, that's the relative minor of this key. And in addition to that, Haydn frequently uses dominant seventh chords as well as fully diminished seventh chords, either a diminished triad or the fully diminished seventh. And I tell my students who are playing this level of Haydn to look for the diminished seventh chords because those are the moments of intensity and high drama. If you look at a lot of developments from Haydn's Sonata Allegro movements, you will find a lot of diminished seventh chords. That's what he uses harmonically to give it a lot of drama and intensity, as I said. So instead of starting at the beginning here today, I actually would like to begin at measure 68 and talk about some of this chord harmony stuff and how you can approach this with your students. Measure 68 is kind of a unique place in this piece. It sounds a little bit more like a Bach prelude or perhaps even something that CPE Bach would have written. And I would draw my students' attention to this in the first lesson just because it's unique and it's fun to look at and show them how they can simply block those chords. So this is 68 downbeat D minor. There's that C sharp diminished triad again goes to D minor. So diminished chords go to the note a half step higher. So from C sharp to D. So C sharp diminished again, D minor, G minor, D minor. Ooh, and then we get that G sharp fully diminished chord, which then goes to the downbeat of 71 A major. So all that movement by those diminished seventh chords is really fun. And then of course, this just is very fun to play if your student has good fingers. You know, on from there. 
If you look at measure 73, we get these just moving down diminished seventh triads. So dramatic sounding. Then it goes down by a whole step in 74. And he repeats that in 75. And that takes us to the D at the downbeat of 77. Then there's one more really interesting diminished seventh thing going on here. In the middle of 77, we have this F sharp fully diminished seventh chord, which then leads to G minor in 78, all while being over a D pedal point. So that left hand pattern also gives this, you know, anxious, intense thing because it's moving so quickly and the D doesn't belong in that chord, right? D doesn't belong there. So that's that pedal point. He then sequences that in measure 80 with the E fully diminished chord going to F major all over a C pedal point. And that's such a fun moment that takes us from all that, you know, mystical chord progression we were doing at 68 lands us solidly at C, which then in 83 and 84, we just break up for a C7 chord. Leaves you hanging. And then we begin the recap back in F major, like we're supposed to be. So after all that, you know, intense stuff, we get these little filigree. And it's just a lovely way to end it with a little bit of a smile on your face. What's gonna happen next? Let's talk about articulation. Articulation in Haydn can be a little bit problematic because of the way he noted, notated it. And throughout this whole piece, you see a lot of these little wedge-shaped staccatos, which Hinson says in his introduction can mean staccato or detached or accented or accented staccato. I believe in this particular movement that they generally just mean staccato, like, you know, shorter and generally light, not a heavy accent, because they're just so frequently throughout, it would be impossible to actually accent every single note that he wrote with that wedge. You find them at the very, very beginning and throughout in this little transitional part at measure 13. I think it's great for students just just think a tall hand and that they're going right to the bottom of the key with a nice good bounce to get the right kind of sound there. At the beginning, I just think of it as on the beat, the measure one act, or staccatos. They're just giving that nice lighthearted character. That's followed by a two note slur. And students usually do not give me enough of a two-note slur gesture. I always encourage them to actually, literally with their wrist, go down and come up so that they can physically feel that gesture and the sound will follow. I think they're oftentimes, particularly in this piece, just thinking ahead to what's coming next and they're not actually listening to what they're doing in that moment. So while they're playing this part in measure two, they're already thinking about the 16th notes that they're going to play next, and I think that's part of the problem. So in general, if you follow the articulation that Haydn wrote, which by the way, Hinson has only added minimal extra slurs from what's in my urtext, the piece already comes alive just by following those markings. And I would just make sure as a teacher to draw my students' attention to that repeatedly and to let them know when I'm not hearing what I see on the page. Because as soon as you do that, like I said, so much of it naturally comes alive. Let's dive into ornamentation. Ornamentation is also problematic in Haydn because it's somewhat of a transition out of the Baroque period and, you know, pre-Beethoven where things start to change. In this piece, we have some trills as well as many appoggiaturas. An appoggiatura is a tiny little grace note looking kind of thing. But in these, they happen all over the place where you have the little appoggiatura, an eighth note, and then two sixteenth notes. And all of those should be played as four sixteenth notes. So again, that happens right there in measure two. Or you find these again towards the end of the exposition, if you look at measure 40. All of those should again just be those groups of four sixteenth notes. You might ask, 
why did he write that like that and not just four sixteenth notes? I think that's a great question that we might not ever know exactly the answer. My idea on it in this particular case is that he wants you to visually see that those are the non-harmonic tones. That example I just played is C major, measure 40. The D is the non-harmonic tone, as is the A in the next beat. When you play the E in beat four, or I'm sorry, it's the last eighth note of the beat, the fourth eighth note. The E is a harmonic tone. So Haydn is visually highlighting, like I said, the non-harmonic tones that get a little extra emphasis because they are those ornaments in that way. The trills can be really tricky in this because so many of them approach the trill from the note above, and that's when you get to make some personal choices. If you look at the one in measure three, I would have the student play that C appoggiatura and then just trill starting on the B flat. You could repeat the C. This happens in other places as well. The other really difficult trill in this is the long left hand trill in the recap. So this is at measure 105 and the left hand has been playing G and B in measure 104. End on B. And then with that little upward hook before the trill marking, that means you're supposed to start on B and then the trill should be D, C. So if that hook were not there, it, it would make sense to generally start that trill on the note above, which is D. But with that hook there, I think that implies best that you replay the B. For students for whom that trill is difficult technically, I would just have them measure it out as 30 second notes, so just on each measure. By doing the hook on the B, you get the D sounding on the downbeat if you are measuring it out, which is how it should be with that non-harmonic tone. And then if they can measure it and get through the right hand through there, then of course you can talk about speeding up the trill and having it not metrically aligned. At this particular level, if I have an early advanced student that this is solidly at their level, I know that I'm making adjustments and it's really okay in my mind if they just play that measured through as those 30 second notes. We might experiment as much as we can with taking it out of that. And if you listen to professional recordings, they do play that trill very, very quickly. But I think it really is okay at this level. You know, if you're talking a pre-college student, a high school student, to have them play that measured so that it doesn't ruin the tempo or the right hand articulation or any of that, and they can just get through it. Students oftentimes spend so much mental energy focusing on the trill. I would want them to get past that and be listening to the right hand and just let the trill exist down there in their left hand. So lastly, in this short tutorial, I just want to talk briefly about dynamics, which unfortunately Haydn didn't really write a lot of. So you might want to look at an editorial edition to find out what some ideas would be. But again, I've already talked about how the music, the theory itself kind of tells us where the intense moments are. We have a few echoes here and there, um, but in general, thinking about the sequences, the echoes, and how he has written the accompaniment styles and all of that, you can start to have an idea of what the lighter places are and what the more intense places are. In general, because the 30 second notes move so quickly, you can't play this with a heavy hand. It has to be very, very light, but just the amount of notes will naturally give it more sound when you're going through those 30 second parts. I believe the opening should be generally pretty light, maybe a mezzo piano, mezzo forte. with that nice shaping in these you know, phrases that we have here. We oftentimes encounter a lot of two plus two equals four phrases in things like Haydn, so look for those as well. Listening for balance. Very quiet left hand, which you can achieve by doing some rotation and just lightly resting on top of the keys, not doing individual finger movement through there. This is in the time period that we now call Haydn's Sturm und Drang, or storm and stress. And so while this culturally might not seem super dramatic to those of us who live in the 21st century and hear film scores all the time, or you know, even post, we have our post-romantic ears with things like Brahms, this is not nearly as naturally dramatic as that. It's still 
great to identify what's happening in the music, what chords is Haydn using, how is he doing the accompaniment, how many 30 second notes do you have happening at a time, what articulation has he given you, to know where the places are that are those dramatic moments, even though they just don't sound quite as dramatic to our ears, and have that help you inform overall character choices and what your student wants to convey to their audience when they perform this piece. All right, I hope that gives you a few ideas on how to teach this Haydn fantastic sonata. Don't forget to check out the Patreon page for the bonus material about memorizing this particular movement. If you have questions about this piece or any others, leave them in the comments. I would love to know, and I wish you all the best in your teaching.